Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. I'd like to look at some lessons this morning from the life of King Hezekiah, the kingdom of Judah. See here some groundwork how his reign began. But points this morning, we've seen three tests that God allowed in his life in life of King Hezekiah, and how he responded to those. Second Chronicles chapter 29. If you would read the thing, we'll start in verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, if you would please turn to chapter 31, 2 Chronicles 31. Look at the last verse, 21. First Chronicles 31, 21. Speaking of Hezekiah, and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, and in the law, and in the commandments, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, humble to come before your people, bearing your message and your word, show these thoughts to me and challenge my heart as I've been studying them, and put them together into a sermon. I pray that your words and message would come through, that you'd hide me behind the cross, that it would not be me that's seen, but you, just a vessel pouring out your love, your message, your people. I pray that you bless our pastor and be with us in spirit this morning. And I Come as he's serving, would you protect him? Give him the grace that he needs as he's helping. In your name I pray. Amen. So we'll be looking at three tests that Hezekiah had, but the verses that we just read set a good framework for his life, the things that we'll see that affect him. I love that it said the first year of his reign. The very first month of it, he went and opened the doors of the temple. They had been nailed shut by his father to keep people out of worshiping. And that was the first priority for him, was opening the doors so people could come in and worship the Lord. In similar fashion, if we were to serve the Lord or do anything good, it has to be done through his grace. If we don't open our hearts to Christ and his payment, rely on our own goodness, we can't even begin to serve the Lord in the ways as a did. We have to humble ourselves, ask for Christ's forgiveness and salvation. The dead and paid when he died on the cross, open our hearts up to him as he opened the temple back to God's worship. And then he can begin to work for us when we're living, living for him. Love that it says he did it with all his heart. Many of the other kings before it said they did well, but didn't didn't serve the Lord with all their heart. They tried to mix doing things their own way. If we're going to serve God. We have to be sold out, doing it all for Him. If you would turn with me, please, to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18, begin reading in verse number 4. Hezekiah's story is actually told in three different books. Here in 2 Kings, where we were reading in 2 Chronicles, and also in the book written by Isaiah the prophet, bears his name. We'll be looking at all three, comparing each one comes from a slightly different angle, but tells the same story of how God worked through his life. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning verse 4. This is speaking of Hezekiah. He removed the high places, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. 
For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So this is the second thing he did before we get into the test God gave him. Was he purged away the dross, as the Bible refers to it, things that were holding back the kingdom, not only getting rid of the idols that were in direct opposition to God, but the high places, this brass serpent, Moses had made the serpent actually in the wilderness. There had been a plague, and serpents had come and started biting the children of Israel. And God had told him to take brass and make a snake on a pole and set it up, and anyone who would look on the snake, believe, would live. It had originally started out as something good, but at this point, the children of Israel had actually started worshiping the serpent, forgetting that it was God who would work through that, and that was just a symbol. So we cut it in pieces, calling it Nehushtan, which means it is brass, because that's really all it was. It was a piece of metal. It was a symbol of God. Sometimes it's working on work for the Lord. There's things that may be good. The good can be the enemy of the best. The high places sometimes were used for sacrifice to God, but they disobeyed his commands, which were to sacrifice at his altar at Jerusalem. He needed to purge those things. And so people would worship God fully, again, not fixing their own ideas. So he's set up well. He's allowed God to be the one in the kingdom. And we get out the things that would be distractions, taking away from that. I'd like us to see the first of the trials that God allowed to come to him. If you would look where we are in 2 Kings 18, look at verse 13. Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up? against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. This is significant. The Assyrian Empire was to the north of Israel. And in the beginning of Hezekiah's reign, they did finally move down and taken complete control of the northern kingdoms, the ten tribes that had split away, and had taken them over. And now their king has moved into Judah and is threatening to take over the very capital. The Assyrians were a brutal empire known for enjoying to inflict as much pain as they could on their captives. This is a very significant threat. And I see areas in our lives where there's a threat coming in, like Assyria, from the outside circumstances that seem to be crushing in, that we have no control over. Things, the loss of a job, loss of a loved one, bills that need to be paid, things that we don't see any way for us to deal with. But God is there with us. If you would look over with me now in chapter 19, verse 10. 2 Kings 19, 10. This is the king of Assyria speaking, trying to frighten the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem from fighting against him so he could just march into the city and take it over rather than having to lay siege to it. Him speaking in verse 10, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran? Rezeph, and the children of Eden, which were in Philistia. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad, the king of the city of Sepharvim, and Hana and Ivah? Hezekiah received the letter, the hand of the messengers, and read it. Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubims. Thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast been heaven and earth. Bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, 
which has sent him to reproach the living God. Basically what the king of Assyria is saying here is, look at all these other gods that I've taken over. He was comparing the kings and the gods of other nations. Forgetting this is God with a little g. These are gods of stone and wood. He said, if they couldn't protect them, why are you trusting in your God? Why not just surrender and quit? He's making a fatal mistake because Hezekiah is trusting in the living God created heaven and earth. God all-powerful. These were gods of stone, the inventions of men's hands, so no wonder he could take them on. It's a whole different game he's fighting against the Lord of hosts. A lot of times when we're going through hardships, we'll have that guilt or sadness. Sometimes the devil, it seems, whispering in our ear, it's not worth it. Don't try and stand up and fight. Look what happened to other people. I can take you out too. Forgetting that we have God on our side. His Holy Spirit in our hearts. Here also, these chapters, for sake of time, we won't read it, but going through, it's almost two chapters of the messengers from Sennacherib coming and walking around the walls of Jerusalem telling the people how worthless it is to stand up and fight. Messengers from Hezekiah came out to them and said, Look, we understand the Syrian. Just speak to us in your language, and we'll go speak to Hezekiah and tell him what you guys are asking for. And Sennacherib's men said, no, we're here to talk to everybody on the wall, and started screaming out in Hebrew, telling them it's worthless. Don't trust your God. Don't trust your king. Just come out and surrender to us. It'd be equivalent to nowadays saying, someone, would you give me a call? We'll talk it over. And then they go on social media of their team post something saying their viewpoint rather than humbly negotiating it because that was his goal. His goal was not to beat them. He didn't want another long fight. He was fighting against the quiche at the time. It was another fortified city. His hope was to trick them into giving up and surrendering early. A lot of times there will be voices telling us that the circumstances are crushing. No reason to fight back. We have every reason to fight back. Because we're fighting for God's honor. He's at stake. And whether we win or lose reflects on him. Hezekiah took this letter, these things that had been posted in a sense against him, and spread it out before the Lord and said, Father, I can't handle this. But this is against you. They're coming physically against us, but Sennacherib has said, God is not powerful. God takes it very seriously when his honor is at stake who work through our crushing circumstances. If you would look with me, please, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, again, this is one of the parallel passages. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, we'll be reading verses 7 and 8. This is Hezekiah speaking to his men, encouraging Jerusalem to be strong and be ready. Verse 7 says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid, nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Interestingly, there's more with us than with him, something that Elisha said when the Syrians had come to besiege his city, and his servant said, what are we going to do? He said, look in the hills, they're full of angels. There's more with us than there are with them. Hezekiah had eyes and faith. See, there's more on his side. Sennacherib's trusting in his might, his army, and hundreds of thousands of warriors. Forgetting that there's a God in heaven that created every one of those souls. Amen. That's who Hezekiah's trusting in. He had done his part to prepare Jerusalem, but that was not his confidence seemed out of his control, it was far from out of God's control. The defense was against him. It's been said, are you telling God how big your problems are? Tell your problems how big your God is. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 37 to see the conclusion of this first test?
Isaiah 37. What's interesting about Isaiah's perspective on it is he was here. He's mentioned several times in the story, speaking to God for him. He was an eyewitness of it. So he writes from his perspective, seeing what God was doing in the kingdom. If you would look with me in Isaiah 37, we'll read verse 23. This is God speaking his answer by Isaiah to Hezekiah. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed me, speaking of Sennacherib? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. Look down on me. Verse 33. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the sea shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred and four score and five thousand, one hundred eighty-five thousand troops. And when they rose up early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went, and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. God dealt with this in his time. He says, verse 35, that he would defend the city and save it for his own sake, for his reputation. Because that's what we're here for, is to show God's glory. That's what the Assyrians were fighting against. That's why God fought back against them. We know that God's in control, but sometimes, though, God doesn't remove the circumstances, but rather gives us strength in them. Isaiah 40, 31, just a few chapters over, says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and shall mount up with wings as eagles, and shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint and wait upon the Lord. Sometimes in our lives, God will allow a circumstance that seems out of our control, something coming in, and He'll give us the strength to get through it, or be glorifying Him through it, even if He doesn't remove it. But either way, we know that He's in charge. It's his honor. If we do as Hezekiah, they bring it before him and say, Lord, I can't fight this, but I'm going to give it to you. Trust him. Either way, he will be glorified. If you would turn with me now, we'll look right over in the next chapter, Isaiah 38. This is the second trial. The first was coming from without. The second is coming from within. Isaiah 38, 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go, and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. You would look with me down now in verse 19. Hezekiah proceeds from verses 10 through 20 to praise the Lord for his goodness to him, in healing his sickness. Pick it up in verse 19, Hezekiah speaking, the living, the living, he shall praise thee, as I do this day. The fathers and the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my song to the string instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. He's saying, we're going to praise God for what he had done. God <clears throat> delivered them from the enemies coming in from without. Now the sickness from within. 
was thinking of things that we have sometimes that are happening within our own bodies or our own homes that sometimes seem beyond our control. A wayward relative, a sickness, maybe something besetting that we can't seem to get rid of. Any kind of thing that is coming from within us can be very discouraging. Hezekiah turned to the Lord again and prayed to him, deliver him. Again, imagine we could hear a diagnosis this day that someone is terminal, or maybe advanced in the stage of their disease. Can you imagine having a prophet of God Almighty coming and saying, you are going to die, get your will ready, get your house set in order, your time is done. But he continued to keep his focus on the Lord. God was using it as a test, I believe, to see his faith. Would he rely on him through the sickness? And again, we can rely on God, even if the answer is not a help. Because if he's working for his glory, maybe it's for his glory that someone goes home to be with the Father. But if we continue to focus on him through the hardships, he gets the glory from it. Rather than Satan getting the glory, he discouraged us through the hard times. Even Elijah got discouraged after a great victory on Mount Carmel. If you look over with me just a few pages, we'll look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, 2 is God speaking a promise to me, to all of us. Isaiah 43, 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. He doesn't say that take him away, but he does say he'll be with us through it all. Walking through the fire, as we heard in Sunday school this morning, when the three Hebrew children were from a fiery furnace. God didn't take it away, but he was there with them through it. It speaks comfort to us that we know the ours from the trials seem consuming, like we'll be burned. God will be there, using the refined way to point us back to him. So we've seen he had a trial from without the Assyrians, a trial from within of this sickness. Third, I'd like us to look at is Isaiah chapter 39. It's prosperity. Isaiah chapter 39. His prosperity is what is really tested. It's the cause, rather, of it. Isaiah 39, starting verse 1. At this time, Mordach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Hezekiah was glad of them, and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold, and the spices and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. And came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? Once came they unto thee. Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thy house. And that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, there shall be peace and truth in my days. So he's tested from the outside, tested from the inside. But then, this is where it hit home for me, was his prosperity was a temptation. We see God working in our country and our lives, giving us freedom, giving us success. Sometimes it seems easy to get our eyes off of him and forget. That's why I added emphasis. He said his, 
mind, I, everything that was there, we've forgotten. We're all gifts from God. Sometimes we right. forget. We forget. God's the one who showered his blessing upon us. He made our country great, protected us, gave us the freedoms that we have, gave us the success we've had financially. He's the one who protects us. When Solomon was king, the queen of Sheba had sent him and come to see his greatness. But what she left with was a sense of God's greatness. He showed her the temple and the wisdom God had given him. Hezekiah fell short here that these ambassadors came from Babylon and what they left with was how great Hezekiah was and how great his riches he amassed. He didn't. At least it's not reported that they left with any sense of God's greatness. It's convicting to me when I touch a life, do I show them God or do I show them me? Do people walk away with a sense of how great I am when it should be pointed to my Creator who has done anything good should show them God's house, not mine. Amen. You turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, we'll look at verse 24. Isaiah 45, 24, Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. It's the Lord who gave and has a high of righteousness and strength. He's the one who washed us from our sins and given us righteousness and strength. That's what God's saying. Reminder, it's not you. It's not me. It's him. We look over in chapter 57 with me. Isaiah 57, please. Isaiah 57, we'll read verses 15 through 18. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wrong. For the spirit should fail before me, and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wrought and smote him. I hid me and was wrought. He went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways, and I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. God's saying here that he is all powerful. Really, when you think about it, the only way that he's limited, that's if he's powerful, God and can do all, is when we choose to limit him in our that's lives. Right. That's right. Amen. When we choose sin instead of God, he has to pull back his hand of blessing. Hezekiah, who had been protected all this time from without and from within, God says now, my hands are pulled back because you have thought so much of yourself that I'm pushed out. Who's on the throne? God or us? Proverbs 16, 18. This pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Hezekiah's son Manasseh was lifted up with pride, and it was during his reign that the Babylonians did come, did capture him, and did take all of those riches just as God had said. Pride's a dangerous thing. It can cost us a lot. Or we can choose to humble ourselves before the Lord, allow him to come back through. We'll all see times so when we start to stray. But what do we do? You turn with me to 2 Chronicles 32. We'll see what Hezekiah did. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. <laughs> 2 Chronicles 32. This is, again, a parallel passage, and so it's speaking of the same sickness, but the Chronicles, the whole story is condensed down a bit. We'll start in verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah was sick to death, and prayed unto the Lord. And he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. 
but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore was wrath upon him and upon Jerusalem, upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of God came out upon them in the days of Hezekiah. It says that he humbled himself. That's the way for us as well. We'll all stray and see areas where our hearts started to get lifted up and pride and forget it. But God in his grace will show us, as he sent Isaiah to humble Hezekiah and point out his faults. And the question is, what do we do when God points that out? Do we continue on? Or do we see that his spirit is gone from us and humble ourselves? If you would turn with me, please, now to the New Testament, I'd like us to look at the words of Paul, starting 2 Corinthians. Paul was an apostle. He had been a Pharisee were the strictest adherence to the code of law that God had given in the Old Testament. They followed everything to a T to make sure that they were being holy. And he also reports that he studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of the law at the time. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He had many things that he could glory of himself. But see what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 about glory. He's gone around most of the known world, planted churches and written epistles to them, discipling believers and building them up. 2 Corinthians 10, 17, Paul says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, if you turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 7 through 9. Philippians 3, we'll start in verse 7. This is after Paul listing off some of the things that he had done prior to coming to Christ. He says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith is as we had said earlier Anything good that we do on our own, keeping God's laws, is only our righteousness. It'll never get us to heaven. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. And Paul said that he forsook all of that. Anything good he'd done, even though he had kept God's laws, he was a sinner before God. No one can be perfect. And none of that was of any worth to him. Only what Christ had done in his heart. Lastly, if you would turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, we'll read verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul is saying all the great things he had done, either before being saved or once Christ had come to him, that of any of those, nothing was worth glory. But in Christ's cross, that Christ had to come and die for him, a sinner, just as he's done for anyone on this world. Paying his perfect blood on the cross for us, that that was the only thing that he could glory, was that his sin had caused God to step down from heaven in human form and die on a cross for us. And that should be our glory as well. As we pray for God, will be glorified if we have problems coming from without, like the Assyrians, or sickness or something within, or the Lord blesses us with prosperity, safety, health, finances, that in all of those, our focus is on Him, is on His glory, 
on spreading his message using what he's done, and when we stray, coming back to the Father, asking for his forgiveness, humility. Would you pray with me?